What's going on? Welcome to the new music business. I'm your host, Ari Herstand, author of How to Make It in the New Music Business. The book, audiobook of the third edition, is out now, along with the hardcover and the ebook. Uh, hello from Music Biz in Nashville. Uh, if my voice sounds a little raspy, that is because I have eaten way too much Nashville hot chicken, and I think it is singed the back of my throat, <laughs> and also talking over all the music. I'm learning a lot here and uh, meeting a lot of incredible people, the movers and shakers of the music business here in Nashville. And uh, so for this week, we decided to put together a highlight episode covering the live touring music industry. And so this week, um, if you're interested in the live music landscape post-COVID and what's happening right now, this is definitely the one to check out. The guests that you're going to be hearing from today include Brandon Pankey of Live Nation, Tom Windish, uh, Billie Eilish's booking agent of Wasserman, Jordan Anderson, the Troubadour talent buyer, Bob Babish of Summerfest, the summer music festival, long running, world's largest music festival in Milwaukee, Theo Katzman and Corey Wong, both of Wolfpack, along with they each have very successful solo projects. I just saw Theo on tour just a couple weeks ago. You may have caught my piece in Variety where I wrote about that experience. Cam Franklin from the funk soul band The Suffers and Carrie Rayburn, our instructor for Ari's Take Academy's course, Special Events. His band is Electro Swing Band, Good Co. They specialize in playing the Performing Arts Center and Special Events Market. So this is um, it's jam packed. You're gonna, we're gonna be jumping through the guests, but um, we just kind of highlighted the best moments of each of their episodes to kind of pull out the most value and the most and the best information. But of course, all these episodes do exist in your podcast feed if you want to dive deeper into any of these guests. But right now, if you could just pause this and leave us a five-star review on Spotify or Apple Podcasts, that really helps. Click the subscribe or follow button so you get us in your feed. A lot of great guests are coming up very soon. You're not going to want to miss them. And uh, leave us a comment on YouTube or Instagram, or you can actually leave uh, some feedback on Spotify now. There's a little Q&A section down below if you want to check that out and you're listening on Spotify. And uh, visit ariestake.com, get on that email list. That's where you're going to get the most relevant information we send out, you know, when the new episodes drop, but also all the relevant info about the new music business. I'm going to have some takeaways from Music Biz and I'll be sending that out to the email list. All right, let's kick into the show. From like a very macro sense of like the operations of Live Nation as a promoter, just for somebody who doesn't really understand maybe what a promoter does, what Live Nation does, just to kind of grasp it. And then we, I want to get deeper into kind of how artists can take advantage of it. Live Nation is the largest promoter of live shows in the world. And so okay. we're seeing promoting a show, you know, just from step by step. There is an artist that wants to perform in a particular venue. They will work yes. with a Live Nation they will receive something called a guarantee. Guarantee mm. is basically with the fee that artists will receive. There are different variations of that where it could be a guarantee versus deal where instead of you receiving you know X amount of dollars, you'll do a versus deal where you're betting more on yourself, where it's like, look, you'll receive what we make when at the door. And so there are ways that that deal works out. The artist goes, performs, they receive a check from this promoter. The promoter will then make their money off of tickets and potentially some other ancillaries. Live Nation is phenomenal because Live Nation is everywhere. It's in almost every country in the world. Mm-hmm. Own and operate venues. The live ticketing business is larger than it has ever been. Mm-hmm. Really bounced back since COVID, since 2020 and 2021. 2022, we're selling tickets at a higher rate per, on a per quarter basis than we did in 2019. And 2019 wow. was the largest year ever. So now 2022 wow. is on track to be the largest year ever for Live Nation and for live events. So we're all the way back. You know, if you are an artist, that's why I I go back to what we talked about earlier. It's so important to build relationships with those local bookers and those local promoters because there's probably a festival in every major market now. And Mm -hmm. as you start building your name up in some of these smaller venues, there's absolutely an opportunity to be on one of the quote unquote smaller stages or second or third stage of fill in the blank festival in that particular market to start out with. What what is your recommendation specifically to these artists on what they should be doing? They should be working. 
they should be hustling. They should be getting to know all of the, the local promoters, all of the local booking agents in their city, because it's always important, particularly in this culture, in this climate. It's funny, I just had another panel discussion today um, and we were talking about, you know, sort of where the album is in 2022. And, you know, if you're on TikTok and you're listening, looking at a dance, you, you may know the song and it's popular, but you don't know who the artist is. Right. And so it really is about artist development and where you get your core audience and your fan base is always, always, always going to be through live. So I would mm. always, you know, in Philadelphia, reach out to the TLA, which is a thousand capacity venue, reach out to the Foundry, which is 500 capacity mm -hmm. and try to get on, be an opener for some of these yep. other acts. You know, there's something called consignment where, you know, if I'm an opening artist, you'll give me 100 tickets, sell yep. these tickets. And if you can sell out 100 tickets through consignment as a local promoter, I'm like, wait a minute, is this somebody I should have opening up for the next show and the next show? And then mm -hmm. now you're on the radar of a live nation of an AEG or another mm -hmm. promoter. And now you can slowly start to matriculate and, and be in some more in those rooms and, and start to build your core fan base. That's wow. the way for me from a live perspective, work, yeah. work, yes. make sure that you're, <laughs> you know, you're, you're doing everything you need to do in your power to succeed. Yeah. It's really refreshing to hear that live is important. And I do hear that from managers and from label execs and label a and &R, even though the industry is so obsessed with TikTok right now and everything that everyone's talking about is TikTok, like you said, a lot of the kids might know the song, they don't know the artist. And that seemingly, that fame is fleeting. And you could be flash in the pan moment and then even if they might come check you out live, and if you can't bring it live, then you're gonna lose that audience before you even get them. Luck is merely when preparation meets opportunity. And so grinding it out live, like you said, then when it gets to the point where maybe you do get some bubbling up online and people wanna come check it out, or maybe Brandon happens to be in the, in the room for your show, but you've played a hundred shows before that and you know how to bring it live, you know how to work a room, and then that opportunity presents itself and then you can bring it. There's nothing that beats hard work. Um, there's not, I, literally in this industry, and you know, there's some individuals like, you know, I'm gonna get a million views on, on YouTube and then I've made it. And yeah. I know we pay attention to analytics on the label side so much, right. I get it, I, I, right. I really do but nothing beats that fan connection. Nothing mm. beats that experience when I see mm -hmm. somebody performing live and they mm -hmm. kill it, they are incredible. I'm going to keep coming to that show and I'm gonna be excited to see them on a festival. And that's where we as promoters, we have to stay in the culture, you know, have to understand who's hot, who's coming. It's easy, it's super easy to throw a million dollars at this person or that person if you're a large promoter. Right. It's easy. It is what it right. is. But where you win is in the trenches, using mm. a sports analogy. But when you when you can get those artists who are bubbling and emerging right before they make it, but you were that festival that had it and you introduced a thousand fans to that artist, yep. you're now the, one of the more reputable festivals. You're the festival I want to come back and give my funds to. The experience is so crucial that I don't think we talk about enough and I don't think artists think about enough is you are creating an experience. And what do you want that experience to be? Because you're essentially performing from the moment you walk in the venue, whether you like it or not, and all eyes are on you. If you haven't worked out that entire set from the moment you step onto the step off, you're dropping the ball. I'll say this, 60 to 90 minutes, which is generally uh, the, the timing of a headline performance for an artist, can be one of the longest 60 to 90 minutes ever if you're not performing at a certain level, or can be the quickest, most amazing 60 to 90 minutes ever if you are yes. doing what you're supposed to do as an artist. But there are some people um, that are not in the industry that will say, well, man, artists make a lot of money and they just get up on stage for, for an hour or for 90 minutes before. And I'm like, no, 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 no. They don't just get up on stage. They are entertaining hundreds mm -hmm. of thousands of people at one time. And I don't know if you understand, I argue with two people um, if we have one or two differences. You're dealing with thousands of people, whether you're a doctor, whether you're a lawyer, whether you're a garbage you know, man, whether you are mm -hmm. a firefighter, you are dealing with so many individuals at once. Mm. And you are connecting everyone through their love and passion for you as an artist. Do not forget about your artistry and who you are to each and every one of your fans. And I think when you think about that and really think it through, that's when the artists that really shine, shine. And, and they mm. shine. It's about authenticity as an artist. Mm. It's also, and I mentioned this before, it's about practicing your craft, not just practicing in the studio, but practicing on that stage and really honing your live experience. Because here's the thing. And I say practice is, makes perfect. It may not be a great example, 
But if I have a serious surgery, I don't want the doctor that this is their first surgery. I, I, <laughs> right. I, I want the doctor who's been doing this, you know, a few times before yeah. they get on and do the surgery for me. And that's the same way with music. I want somebody that really cares about it and has practice and understands what they're giving um, to the audience and to their audience because it's their fans. And that's yes. why, you know, it's such a disservice when artists don't take the time to really perfect that because you're not just doing it for strangers. Or you might be doing it for the friend of your fan. But be clear, the majority of yeah. the people in that room are there really for you. So I want to talk about um, opening tours and opening slots for a minute. Um, you know, how does that operation work in terms of... Uh, Let's say there's a, a a tour that's completely set up for the headliner. They're playing maybe let's say mid level clubs, uh, fifteen hundred cap room, something like that. Um, and for I guess on your end, when if you've set the tour up, how do you find appropriate openers? And then on the other side, if there are acts out there that want to open these tours, what are the good expectations for them, and how should they approach it? Um. Often the, the artist headlining has a point of view about who they would like to open. <laughs> They're okay. fans of a bunch of different bands. They follow them on social media. They may have worked on music, played shows with them before, whatever. Um, mm -hmm. They're friends and they want them to go on tour. Very often that's what happens. Okay. Um, sometimes they don't have an idea or the ideas they have aren't going to work out for whatever reason. And in that case, we'll go and ask every agent in the business for ideas. Um, and then we'll present a list of, like we call them submissions mm -hmm. to the management, we'll present them to the artist. Um, we usually give them some information about each of the submissions, you know, like when they're releasing music, um, maybe a little bit of tour history, um, that type of thing, uh, a link to listen to music. Uh, maybe like some information about socials or Instagram or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, and we send that over and they make a decision or they ask some questions and we start, we get into conversations with the people who submitted those, those artists. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes an artist, like maybe they want to play that room that fits 1500 people, but they can only sell a thousand tickets and then they're looking for an artist who's going to sell 500 tickets. Mm -hmm. um, that's a little bit different um so then we'll go out to all the other agents in the business and ask for you know more specific things we're looking for someone who can sell about 500 tickets or maybe it's not exactly that but you know between mm -hmm. whatever between two and 500 tickets and mm -hmm. the amount of money that we'll pay them varies um mm -hmm. yeah the budget for openers is kind of all over the place too it depends a lot of it depends on how much that artist is worth like how much they've been paid to play those cities before how many tickets they can sell on their own mm -hmm. um yeah it's not always based on that but that's a big factor well so give me an example of uh maybe <laughs> let's say you're you have a mid-level 1500 cap style level uh tour and headliners are doing just fine uh you know they're going to sell out the whole tour with without needing any any help um what could an opener expect uh, to open that tour? And how does that work? Uh, is the headliner providing, uh, are they paying them? Are their expenses covered? Are they hopping in the bus? Is there food, lodging? Like how, how does all that work? So I'd say uh, paying 250, $250 to $500 a show okay. would be pretty standard. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes it's more. Um, I think that would be pretty generous if it was an artist that didn't have a history of selling tickets anywhere. Sure. Sometimes the, the number fluctuates depending on the size of the market because, you know, artists get paid different amounts in a larger market than a smaller one because um, mm -hmm. uh, more people buy tickets, um, people pay more for a ticket and, a big, you know, whatever it is. Sure. Um, and, you know, in terms of like what else is supplied to the opener, it depends. Um, there are cases where there's space on the bus or the artist will carry some of the equipment for them so that they can travel in a smaller vehicle, mm. carry some of the merch for them. Um, sometimes they'll let them use their front of house sound person or 
um, whatever the case, it, I, they don't really provide hotel rooms. Mm-hmm. Um, but even then, like it's more often than not, like it's the artist's responsibility to show up at the venue at a certain time with all your mm-hmm. stuff, get on, on stage, sound check, and play. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's just all on you to figure out how you're going to do it with the budget that is uh, supplied. There's always like an exception. And with that, there's a lot of exceptions, but most of the time, that's how it works. So um, what is your opinion of tour buy-ons where uh, the headliner is requiring their openers to actually the money flowing the other way where <laughs> the openers right. are, they're asking for the openers to pay them for the opportunity to open their tour? I've been doing this for around 28 years and I've never done that. I've heard about it. Yeah. Um, haven't God really bless you, Tom to it happening. <laughs> it, it's, I don't know. I mean, I, I, yeah, I'd say probably most of my peers don't really operate mm. with that either. Um, yeah. Like I've never, I've never had a band like get offered to go on a tour where they had to pay to be on it. I've had mm. people offer to pay our, some of my clients to be on the tour. Yeah. yeah. Um, but that's kind of a red flag, a big red flag in, in my book. Um, mm-hmm. The most, I mean, the most important thing to me is the musical combination mm. and for the headliner to feel like the, the music of the opener is something that they want their fans to hear. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. You know, I want the fans who are buying these tickets to feel like they've gotten value out of the money they spend and the time they spend to show up. Mm-hmm. Um, <laughs> um, I feel like the best opening slots are ones, you know, where the the headliner is really involved and is really passionate about the opener. Mm-hmm. Uh, really likes the music, you know, like you'll go to shows and you'll see like the headline, the singer or something will come out during the open art artist set and sing with them or say like, we really love yeah. this act, really hope you pay attention. And then sometimes that band will go and like sing a song with them in the headliner yeah. set. Like those are the best and where it makes the biggest impact on the opener's career. Mm-hmm. I'm glad you said that it's a red flag, and I'm and I hope that everybody listening to this right now uh, heeds that advice because, you know, we hear um, I, we've heard the horror stories like years a few years back. It came out that that Mo- there's, this is well documented that Motley Crue uh, charged their openers uh, like a million dollars to open their tour, and then their uh, stagehands would come out during their sets and and shoot them with super soakers full of urine and they were like forced to open and like play <laughs> before the doors opened and shit and it's just like you know no respect whatsoever um and I've I've also heard of tour buy-ins where the headliners just couldn't draw and weren't selling tickets even though maybe their Spotify numbers were doing really well and so to kind of help break even they charged their openers a lot of money for that, where it, for the openers, they would play. By the time they were playing, there's five people in the room. And so it's just like not a good deal all around, um, you know. So I, I appreciate that that is your perspective and that's where you stand and that's how you operate. Because uh, frankly, I think it's it's flat out unethical to uh, charge your openers to open for you. And if you can't figure out how to make money by selling tickets and running a music career, then maybe you should be in a different line of work. Um, and so, yeah, that's that's nice to hear <laughs> on your end as well. I mean, I cool. do think like my peers, you know, and there's yeah, there's probably a few hundred agents in this country that I would consider my peers. Yeah, they all kind of operate like, with the same standard. Uh, mm-hmm. The buy on thing, I think, is very unusual mm-hmm. um, for the types of acts that I'm working with. Yeah, that's great. When you're looking, um, or I guess, what does it take for you to kind of start working with a new act? And maybe you can kind of give us some examples of artists that you started working with. I mean, most famously, uh, Billie Eilish, of course, you know, you started with her very early on in her career. I believe I heard somewhere, read somewhere that you signed her before she'd even played a single show. Is that right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah, I started working where they're young. I mean, the, <laughs> uh, I need to love the music. Okay. Um, and you know, I meet I meet the artists and the people that work with them um, when we start talking about working together. And I mean, I want them. I want to get along with them too, and yeah. have like, <laughs> you know, I mean, I'm curious like where they see their career going. Sometimes it's it's hard to say, you know, mm -hmm. if you're young or just at the, or at the beginning of your career, like, um, you don't just sit there and say, I want to play stadiums. Um, that'd be kind of unusual before you'd play the show. Um, yeah. sometimes you might say that. Um, and I wouldn't really balk if someone did say that. Mm -hmm. Um, but I mean, I need to love the music. Mm -hmm. Um, and I mean, I work with a bunch of artists that, you know, don't sell 1500 tickets a night, but I love their music and uh, mm. I'm very proud to work with them. Um, and, you know, I listen to their music in my spare time. Um, yeah. I listen to all my clients music in my spare time. <laughs> um, <laughs> that's, that's nice to hear. <laughs> I, I mean, I, I love all the, the artists I work with. Um, there, I feel like my wife has asked me this other, the other day, like if I'd ever booked anyone because, because of the money and not because of the music and, mm. And uh, there was, I, I can't remember which band it was, but a long time ago, I did that um, one, like once, one or two times. And I sort of convinced myself that wasn't the case, that I loved the music. <laughs> but I could tell when I made like my first phone call that my heart um, and passion uh, was not in it the same way it was for everybody else. You know, it's mm. very easy for me to do my job. I call up people who put on shows and I tell them, you know, you should book this artist. They're amazing. Yeah. You know, yeah. I'm not making it up. <laughs> like I believe they're amazing. <laughs> yeah. Um, and I want them to listen to them and I hope they enjoy them. And if they don't, it's fine. I, I don't take it personally. Sure. Um, I've been told no, you know, way more times than I've been told yes in my, in my career. It just kind of comes with the territory. It's fine. But mm. yeah, I, I love the artists I work with. Mm. Some, maybe to a fault <laughs> <laughs> that's great i sometimes I mean, but... take on artists that are very very early in their career because i just think they're fantastic and um it takes more than just a, a passionate booking agent or even a connected booking agent to become successful um mm. even if i got a band a bunch of tours yeah. um if they didn't have other key members of the team um like it's hard to connect all the dots. It's an incredibly complex business with with a, a very unclear roadmap of how to develop. <laughs> um, yeah, there aren't many books that tell you how to do it. You know, I can. Um, I know one. I'll. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> right. um, you no, know, that that makes sense. Um, so, but but when it comes to working with new artists it's great to hear that i mean you have to love the music but i'm assuming there's other factors that typically go into that because at the end of the day it is a business too and if they're not making much money i mean i, I guess you're you have the luxury of having enough artists that are paying the bills where you could probably take more risks on emerging artists that maybe it takes a little bit more time before you start earning from them uh versus some other agents which you know, need every dollar to kind of keep the lights on. Um, what does it come, I guess, in when it comes to you, when when do artists typically come to you where you're considering them and who and how are they coming to you? Um, I mean, I, I, I have artists email me every day, mm -hmm. a, a bunch of artists. Yeah. Um, and, and not just artists, but, you know, people from labels, lawyers, managers, publicists, Sure. Um, agents in other parts of the world, promoters. Yeah. Um, and you know, the artists are at all different stages of their career. Um, it's really nice when there's a label involved, uh, or people to help release the music that have a track record of releasing music and being successful at that. Mm -hmm. It's nice when they have publicists on board, radio promote, you know, uh, mm -hmm. the, the more established the team, the better chances of success, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, but it's, I mean, I, I still take things on relatively early when a lot of those pieces are not in place. Um, sometimes I help get them in place. Mm -hmm. Um, I do feel like there's been 
we're in the midst of kind of a seismic shift in the music business where pe- there's more artists than ever. You know, we read all the time about you know, how more and more tracks are being uploaded every day. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think a lot of people that provided a lot of different services in the music business are less willing to take things on until it has a certain amount of momentum, you know, either on its own or with other people doing the work. Right. Um, I mean, I, I you hear about labels that are like, well, we don't want to talk to you until you have whatever, you know, a million Instagram followers or this amount of engagement or right. so can sell this many tickets or, um, and, and then I feel that too, you know, because mm. I, I think it takes longer for an artist to develop. Yeah. Um, and if they can't get to a certain place on their own, um, maybe it's a sign that <laughs> they're not going to get to the next level or several levels higher. Mm. Um, yeah, I'm, I think I'm quite a bit more flexible with that type with those types of things. And I take okay. things on sometimes very early. Yeah. Um, but, you know, in my position, I need to be careful of having too many artists that can't sell tickets. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, or can't sell many tickets because, you know, it's, it's always on me to like get another support tour or get another festival. And then yeah. I need to go out to people who are headlining and who book festivals and say, book this artist that can't really sell tickets. Uh, right. And then they'll go do those things and they still can't sell tickets. So I need to go do it again, you know? Yeah. And if it, and it's hard, I can't always just deliver either, you know? Sure. I mean, I have acts that you know, I submit them for a lot of tours and, they don't get any of them. Mm-hmm. Um, and then at a certain point, the artist is looking at me saying, what are you doing? You know, like, isn't your job to get me on tours and festivals? And and I'm like, isn't your job to have people listen to your music and <laughs> you know, want to buy a ticket? <laughs> right. um, um, but yeah, I think I'm, I'm more flexible than, than a lot of people that do what I do. When it comes to... Um newer acts or I should say acts that maybe haven't played the market but are being you know maybe our priority to an agency or Mm -hmm. something like that um Mm -hmm. what you do to I guess uh validate or protect yourself or you know because I I think I've been hearing this a lot and I'm curious your take on this or if you've seen this um Streaming numbers, as as we know, uh, are not always great indicators of ticket sales. Uh, I've heard horror stories of Spotify darlings who are, you know, we're talking tens of millions of streams, probably like million plus two million monthly listeners that are struggling to sell 30, 40 tickets a night. And it's like they're playing these like 400 cap rooms, 500 cap rooms, and it's empty. And I've been I've been seeing this uh, and hearing this. Uh, have you experienced that? What do you look for in kind of these these acts that maybe are are being you know are the priority ones? And they they looks like their social media and their streaming numbers are very impressive. Uh, sure. What is your layer deeper that you go? So uh, there is no right or wrong answer to that. First of all, and there is no way to predict it. So let me preface mm-hmm. there. Um, I hear you on the sometimes they're not worth any tickets if they have numbers but what i will do is go dial in on where are those numbers coming from are they coming from here because mm. if they are there may be an exception to that right mm. so that is i will go look at the streaming markets and what your top 10 are and how many yeah. how many listeners are in this market because yeah. there are artists who exist that have millions of followers or streams but they may only have a thousand people listening in la right now Mm. um so that those exist um i think tiktok you know is also a player in that that you know a lot of people assume hey this this artist is absolutely popping off on tiktok and they very well may be but they're not worth shit in ticket sales yet <laughs> right maybe they will be yeah. um but they're not yet so i will go look at is one are they performing anywhere yet is this mm. their first show is, is this their first tour have they been in support with anyone have they played this market Mm-hmm. Um, and try to also go find what is their show like. So go try to go find some sort of live video of them performing too. Of just like, mm-hmm. like even if there is nothing else to back this up besides their socials, 
like maybe they haven't even released music yet or not a lot. Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. Are people paying attention and engaging with them? And I'll go look at that too. Ultimately, it's also a gut feeling. How do I mm -hmm. feel about this? I, I would like to say that I have great music tastes. So, and you have been pretty good about that gut feeling. I've been wrong 1000%, but I'm more often right than I mm -hmm. am wrong when it comes down to that, um, cool. which maybe that's how I got here. I don't know. <laughs> um, but cool. for yeah. the most part, I will say there's not many cases that come my way that are in that position. Um, okay. There are a few. And gotcha. if I book something that the on sale shit and mm -hmm. we're seeing this be like being a product of that, what can we do to change that? What can we do to push the shadow of the show and help this artist mm. who we may believe can get there and just hasn't yet Yeah, make this better. So they, you know, that's, I will say being a marketer before I was a buyer, mm. that is, that has helped me um, with communicating about shows, being able to dial in with my marketer and kind of, Hey, this is what I would do. This is what I think. Let's go this route. And I, I will pretty much every time get on a marketing call to dial in on something like that too, um, so, to be a part of that conversation. So when it comes to the artists who are listening to this, you, you know, even let's talk about the local ones around Wisconsin or the Midwest. And they're like, man, you know, Summerfest is the dream festival for me. I would just love to play Summerfest. What is your recommendation for them to how to go about getting a spot at Summerfest? Well, you know, people always say, well, you get bands from these local agents or agents mm -hmm. from other cities. And that's not true. We get a couple of bands from those guys, but by and large, if you're out playing in the clubs mm. and the word is out that you're good, either someone's going to come and tell one of us here, or you're going to oh. send something to us, some kind of press kit. Mm -hmm. And we like to look at all that kind of stuff. So please send it all out. We're all here and we love listening. We love finding new stuff and, and persistence is great. You know, sometimes people go, ah, I don't want to bother them. And I, Stop. Don't even worry about that. Bother us. Bother the crap out of us. <laughs> and eventually, someone's going to pick up on it. You know, I mean, look at it this way. For us, from the buyer side, mm -hmm. you don't think we badger these major artists for for acts all the time? I mean, Those we call ways. them till they get sick of hearing from us, right? <laughs> sure. And then finally, they may turn around and say, "Just sell them a damn band. We're sick of listening right. <laughs> to them." You know, and and that's how we, that's kind of how we all started in the business, right? Yeah. I mean, when Summerfest, when I started here forty six years ago. You know, the agents out there, the agents that I'm dealing with now, the, the bigger ones in those companies, they were like me. They were just coming out of the mail room. Right. Right. They were just, right, sure. they were just starting out. Yep. And I would badger. I would badger their bosses and their bosses would say, say to the to their assistants, you sell them a band. I don't want to listen to them anymore. <laughs> and then and we build relationships with those guys. Right. Sure. So we still know those people. So it, it's we have no problem if there's passion. Mm. Right. Yeah. If they, if it's. If somebody's going to badger us and then say, oh, the money's not right, don't do that. But if right. if you want to come to us and you have a passion for playing, yes, you'll get in. It might it may take a little bit, but you'll get in. I love that. That's that's incredible advice. And, and I hope everybody listening is taking that to heart. You're probably going to be eating your words as you're getting a slew of people that are just <laughs> nonstop. 2023. 2023. Right. There you go. That's exactly. Yeah. But I mean, it, it makes perfect sense. And that, that's the thing. I mean, the key to this industry is polite persistence. I mean, that's how you get in the door anywhere, top to bottom, left to right, anywhere in this industry is just by being persistent, but also being polite about it, friendly about it. I mean, Absolutely. Not, you're obnoxious yeah. about it just once. Everybody's going to know it. You yes. know, the next person Absolutely. down the line is going to call and see what about this band? It's going to be, nah, uh-uh. Don't <laughs> exactly. do it. Yeah. Word so, spreads very so, quickly. Yeah. So just, mm -hmm. just to do a good job, understand the situation you're in as a new artist. Yes. Understand you might not be happy with the way things are going backstage and you might be being ignored by somebody, but eventually sure. they'll get it together with you and, and get mm -hmm. your show on and make it work. And if it was great, my, all all my stage managers on the grounds give report cards for every act that plays here. Wow! At the end of the festival, there's a report card, and the the standard line to them is, "I don't care whether whether they I, I don't care how the draw was. I mean, I want to know how the draw was because that's important to us. But how did they treat everybody? How were mm. they backstage? If it was a stage sponsored by Miller, did you hold up a Budweiser that you brought along? <laughs> Don't do that. <laughs> Don't ever do that because sponsors right. are our lifeblood, right? So, yes, yes. <laughs> but, you know, you just, you, you come in 
knowing that you're going to work your way to the top. And if you do a good job and you're professional and your crew is professional, it's great. Interested in what you were saying about the performance value. Yes. Um, I booked for a small club in Los Angeles and um, I was reading just the other day your list of, you know, best independent or best clubs in LA. It was a short list. Yeah. Spoiler alert, the club I booked for wasn't on it. Um, Fourth but, edition. Yes. <laughs> no. It's okay, it's okay. What's your club? My question, uh, Trip Santa Monica. Oh yeah. Um, my question is, um, what can clubs be doing to set artists up for success? Wow, great question. Woo! Oh my God. Yeah! Wow. Yeah, Jenny. Uh, I mean, okay, For let I'll do my take and then you give your take, because whew, first off, thank you for that question. I mean, yeah. usually I think we feel oftentimes that it's like a battle between the artist and the club, and like, you know, oftentimes um, artists feel that the club is supposed to promote the show, and the clubs feel like the, the artist is supposed to promote the show, and in the end, no one promotes the show, and then everybody loses. Um, I think, you know, with um, how the club can set it up, is to really, I mean, it's it's like, I think it, at least in LA, because that's where we are right now, is that um, clubs have gotten very, and promoters have gotten very um, greedy in the sense that because there are so many artists here that uh, they know that they can take advantage of artists and that there's like the pay to play thing that's happening. So one, don't ever do pay to play. Don't make your artists buy the tickets and then sell the tickets. And if you don't sell a certain number of tickets, whether yeah. she's taking it or she doesn't do that, thank you. Um, don't work with promoters that do that, which is a big thing because there's a lot of younger artists that are just getting started. And I'm sure we all get these emails. We all get these emails that are just like, hey, you wanna play the Viper Room? You wanna play the Wissy? I booked the Troubadour, I can do this and do this. And it's like, all you need to do is sell 50 tickets and then you're gonna sell them for $15 a head and da, da, da. And then people don't know that that's not actually the way it should be working. And so I think that like, you know, thinking about what is going to be a fair deal. Also, we want to make sure that you stay in business, but like treating the artists like going after the ones that maybe you really love and respect and, and work at look at it as like a partnership. And it's not just like, oh, this is your show. Figure it out. Bring your crowd. Like, let's all work together on kind of making this this work for everyone. And also, I think like I really hate the L.A. thing of hit it and quit it. I hate that everyone is not, most venues are like, oh, we have a seven o'clock, we have an eight o'clock, we have a nine o'clock, we have a 10 o'clock. Who are you here to see? I got a tally sheet. Okay, you're here to see the nine o'clock? Okay, they're getting your $10 or you're getting 70% of your $10, not the seven o'clock. And which then promotes competition amongst artists because it's like, wait, don't say you're there to see Theo, he's on a 10, say you're there to see me. But it's like, but I wanna see both of you guys. So who's gonna get my money? That's a thing that I, I hate about how LA does it. It's like if everybody just worked together and was like, oh, let's promote a whole night of music, then we're all working together and we all have um, you know, an incentive for the show to be successful. Good call. Yeah. <laughs> Can I? You wanna add? Yeah, I'll add a couple things. Oh, question, what's the capacity of the room? 80 people. 80, okay, sweet. So, small room, yeah. and um, you're probably not bringing in like you know, yeah, it's a certain, it's not gonna, it's, it's not the Theater Ace Hotel, it's not like, Foy Vance is playing there necessarily, unless he wants to do a special kind of smaller thing, right? With an 80 cap room, I would say, because I love an 80 cap room, that'd be like, I love playing 80 cap. Um, as, as, you're an, and you're an independent room, right? So, you promote the shows as the, you're the, you're the buyer or whatever? Partnership. Yeah, 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 S sorry to, to use the term. But um, for me, because I, lo I love playing an independent room, as, f as, as advantageous in the artist's favor as you can make the deal, the better. That's kind of obvious. You know, but that's a big thing because a lot of, lot of places are not that great in that front. If, it, if you can make it sound great, that's great. Mm. And I'm not sure if you have a back line available at all. You do. Okay, that's awesome. I think those are, those are three huge things like... A working back line um, and a good sounding room and an advantageous deal, I think, are, are huge. And don't take a merch cut. I mean, I hate the venues that are taking a percentage of merch because it's like, if you think that, not you, I know you're not doing it, but like, 
there are venues out there that are 250 cap rooms and they're like oh we take 10 percent, we take 20 percent of your merch i'm like well then can i have 10 to 20 percent of your bar like this is not yeah. this can go both ways here what's the deal if i were new to la and i wanted to play my music and i had and i knew i could bring 40 people out and you were like yeah 85 15 deal door deal sell whatever ticket price you want i would be playing your room every every month yeah you know we're seeing these artists that do get their songs on the playlist. They're mm -hmm. oftentimes they're not they're not actually building a fan base. They're building streams and totally. listeners who have no idea who they are. You know, I'll go to see shows of artists who have millions and millions and millions of streams and often sometimes a couple million monthly listeners mm -hmm. and they can't sell 50 tickets to their hometown show. Yeah. And we're in this really weird place right now in the in in the history of the music industry. That's never happened before. Like yeah. you've never gotten a gold record and not been able to sell fifty tickets. You know, like that. Dude, totally. <laughs> well, and then they, I mean, it's like, you know, we're in such a phase of trying to figure out vanity metrics versus real world value. Mm -hmm. And then, like, what really is a vanity metric? What is real-world value? Because a gold record is real-world value. Millions of monthly listeners is real-world value. But, mm -hmm. like, the festival market is going to pay you $1,000 for your set, mm -hmm. you know, or, like, $600 to come play this <laughs> right. festival, and you're going to crappy slot, but you... Not crappy, but, like, a yeah. less-than-ideal spot... And yet you have more streams than everybody at that festival. It's like, it's a, it's a tough thing, but also mm -hmm. different fan bases value different things. So like on the other side of that, an interesting case study on the opposite side that I've noticed is a lot of really popular jam bands, mm -hmm. cats that are pulling in half million dollar, uh, guarantees for festivals. Right. Will have less Spotify action than I do, or you know, yeah. than than some of the just kind of like other mid level artists that are out there. It's like, oh my gosh, how do you have yeah. no streaming? But their their live value is so high. So of yes. course we see both sides of that. But again, it's what does that fan base cherish? What mm. what are they in for? Like why are why are they? connected to this band and it, maybe mm -hmm. it is just a live experience or maybe it is the idea of yeah well i just listen to these bootlegs because i don't like to listen to what everybody else in the public has to listen to this band of this band mm -hmm. so i've got these weird bootleg recordings that don't count as streams mm -hmm. so i don't know like they, they, there's a lot of sides to that too that's a yeah i mean you brought up vanity metrics which i think is really important because this is something that we all battle with because uh, it, it's kind of like, you know, the definitions of success and mm -hmm. what does that mean? And it's like, you know, oh, you only have 100,000 Instagram followers or 10,000 Instagram followers. If you were anything, you'd have 100,000. You know, it's these sure. numbers and these metrics. They're mm -hmm. all vanity. And, and like you said, it's like we like to make snap judgments on uh people's levels of success and that's just as an industry you know I've, I've i've literally talked to talent buyers who will say oh i won't put them on this free showcase of los angeles talent if uh if they don't have at least fifty thousand spotify streams or monthly listeners i'm like what like mm. but you just said like they're, you love them and and you love this music and and that's yeah. an unfortunate thing um is kind of where we're at and and yes like it's it's what is the value of what you're doing and, and bringing in and yes the in the jam world and a lot of artists build it up live and their fan base will buy tickets and they're probably making a lot more revenue at the end of the day, totally. uh, real world value, real world money yeah. than these artists that have millions of Instagram followers and, you know, hundreds of thousands of mm -hmm. monthly listeners and, and all of that. And so it's like, at the end of the day, what are you like, what are you really focusing on and what do we really care about? Yeah. That's what every artist needs to decide for themselves. Mm -hmm. And I think for many of us, we're trying to do have all of it or some mm -hmm. balance of all of it, right? Like that's really the win. And um, also like an accurate representation of all of it, you know, like not having 
Like nowadays, I, I actually have a friend where I, I called him out. I was like, dude, you have bots, don't you? Yeah. <laughs> He's like, what? What are you talking about? Yeah. I was like, I see your Instagram. I see your numbers and it doesn't add up. I see some <laughs> of the comments on your posts and it doesn't add up. I just want you to know that every time I see a questionable comment uh-huh. and I'm thinking, is that a bot? Of course it's a bot. Yeah. Like, don't do that. Like, get rid yeah. of that. So that to me, like, that's my, I, I, maybe some people would have a different philosophy. And that one, uh, I think it was HBO, the fake famous. I saw that. That, yeah. that was pretty interesting to watch. But yeah. anyways, like, that's okay, whatever. Uh, I thought that was actually really cool to watch. Um, mm-hmm. It was interesting to see the different people's reactions to it as well. The, yeah, and, the and just for listeners, subjects. it's they take uh, three people who are wannabe influencers, and they kind of uh, they audition them, and then they they follow these three younger twenty somethings around as they turn them into influencers. And but yeah. a lot of it was buying followers, buying likes, buying comments yeah. to kind of uh, trick the algorithm and to trick people into thinking that they are more famous than they actually are, but they also tricked brands. And that's the most fucked up thing about the whole thing was that people actually sent them products. They got free vacations and free trips places because they had hundreds of thousands of fake bot followers. Yeah. But then it's like, you take that a little bit further. It's like, okay, if you just are trying to get uh, free vacations and free product, then if that's your end game, okay, this is a way to do it. Buy all these fake bots. But in music, what, and I, I always try to remind people, like, and ask them, what is your end game? Yeah. Your end game, I'm assuming, is not free product or free vacations. <laughs> I'm assuming it's a music career, yeah, it's like a, a sustainable career. music career. Yeah, right. So I like that you called them out, and and <laughs> I've started after I watched oh, I'm that. Not, and learned- I'm not afraid to do it now. <laughs> any any of my friends that I that I even remotely suspect, I'll just ask, yeah. <laughs> and I'll get their response, and then that immediately, like, I'll just I'll cold I'll cold call them out on it. Just to yeah. see, you know, yeah. because I, I just think that's, I mean, it's just, it's not good practice. It doesn't seem ethical. I've been talking to a lot of people in the live music industry and, and uh, booking agents and talent buyers and promoters, and it's kind of a shit show right now across the industry. And I'm curious to hear your perspective and your take. Like, how did this tour go? How did these run of shows go? How did the US shows go? How did the Europe shows go? All of it. Give me the uh, give me the, give me the the, the real <laughs> sauce here. <laughs> uh, the real real sauce gets me in trouble yeah. sometimes, and that's why in you're times here. like in time I know, and in times <laughs> like these, I'm like, damn, will it fuck up my bag to tell the truth? Um, <laughs> more than it already has. Sometimes, give me the truth, but it's it's a mixed bag. Okay. I will say yes, yes. In a lot of places, it is a shit show. Mm-hmm. It's not a shit show everywhere. Okay. Not a shit show everywhere. Um, there are a lot of people being overworked. Hmm. There are a lot of people being underpaid. There are some people being paid and not doing the work. Hmm. Uh, <laughs> I, I just came off of two and a half months of touring in a year where we were one of the first bands to come back and really tour independently and i've seen everything from hey your show is being canceled because there weren't enough tickets sold Mm -hmm. to hey yeah the ticket sales are low only to find out that the ticket link actually went on sale three days before we got there oh my god uh oh yeah (laughs) and the fans were the ones to tell us this and so that was yeah you you, (laughs) i never thought i would see a promoter get yelled at uh by fans and yeah. not by, like <laughs> it, right, it right. was it was it was a long tour um there were also some slam dunks in some new markets uh yeah. that we weren't <laughs> we weren't planning on at all um and shout out to Portsmouth New Hampshire um amazing I know right but uh <laughs> there were other places where We'd never been there before that, you know, we were just like, look, we know we're going to take a loss on this Europe. Mm-hmm, um, mm-hmm. And we know we're going to have to like fight to get back into this market when it is time. Yeah. Um, but I will say it was worth every dollar lost lo- mm-hmm. to get back over there, having not yeah. been over there, especially as an indie. 
in almost five years, I think a little mm. over five years. And <sighs> it's frustrating to hear about independent music because what really is considered independent nowadays? Mm -hmm. You know, does it, are you independent if you have a licensing deal with a major? Mm -hmm. Are you independent if you have a licensing deal with anybody? Mm -hmm. Are you independent if you're getting help? Like what, what really determines that? And I know that's not really what the conversation is, but I think. No, it definitely I, is. I think that it has to be asked at the same time, because yeah. if you're not asking those questions, it's like ignoring the middle class. Mm. And if you don't look at those mid tier artists that can barely come back to work right now, yeah. even though it's just as necessary to their mental health and livelihood to play live as it is to, you know, the folks that play every week or the folks that play every night or the folks that are only on the grandest of stages. Um, a lot of people are not going to survive this. And I think what we're all being told in terms of oversaturation is really, really one-sided thinking. Hmm. If like, I really do think it's one-sided thinking. I do think that, yes, we're <laughs> in terms of traditional touring. Yeah. We can't think the way that we once did. It's there's very few bands that are out here doing, um, you know, first time ever tours and selling sure. out rooms or yeah. groups that don't have, uh, you know, hits out right now, be that online or on actual radio filling rooms. It's mm -hmm. <laughs> I feel like all of the traditional rules do not matter, but at the same time, there are some people out here absolutely crushing it. Yeah. Um, and is it because they have money? Not necessarily, because there are some folks that have the biggest budgets out there that mm -hmm. aren't doing that great, that are mm -hmm. seeing rooms uh, not get filled up. And mm. I don't think that now is the time that we're going to really see the analysis or data that yeah. we truly want to see, because all that we have to compare it to is, one year that's not even finished mm -hmm. back on mm -hmm. um and a lot of people are honoring contracts from 2019 right. so in terms right. of like <laughs> in terms of like whether your record came out or you had a good year it doesn't really matter yeah, <laughs> it doesn't I, really matter because like all the things that would be traditional are not to play and some of those contracts haven't expired and some of those artists sure. can't fulfill them or some mm -hmm. are, of those bands don't exist anymore or some of those artists are not able to tour in the capacity in which they once were or sure. some of them are so big that sorry baby you just got bought out by x corporation that needs them more right now yep. and so you're seeing with all of those things happening you're seeing a lot of forced industry shift mm. where a lot of people that used to run shit, I'll be shocked if they're running the same shit that they were this time two years from now. I, yeah, no, absolutely. I'm, I'm curious um, because, yes, we have been hearing a lot about oversaturation. Um, as, you know, Polestar came out with some numbers um, like last month saying, you know, 2022, if you look at the macro scale and the macro numbers, best year on record, believe it or not, you know, and it's like, the the highest revenue generated across the industry uh ticket sales have gone up etc cetera, etc cetera. but those are like the superstars and that's what's generating kind of those macro numbers and then when i talk to more of these mid-level indie artists the touring artists even the clubs i like we had i saw you played the brooklyn bowl we had paul bacher who's the talent buyer of the brooklyn bowl and uh, on the show and you know across the board they're just like it's What's so crazy is like, okay, yes, there's the oversaturation that everybody gets back on the road at the same time. And so fans now have to decide like where where are they going to spend their money and what shows they're going to go to. I mean, that particular night, it was us at Brooklyn Bowl mm -hmm. or Nathaniel, I think, who was at Radio City. Nathaniel and we share, Yeah, and yeah. we share a lot of the fans with the Night Sweats, yeah. even though we're on different, you know, spectrums or whatever. And yeah. I, I always feel responsible for my own numbers. I feel like mm -hmm. it would be very easy because at the end of the day, there's millions of people 
in New York City. There's hundreds of thousands of people. And sure. that doesn't necessarily mean like, oh, we're all going for the same, you know, listeners because mm -hmm. their fans go one way once you get through their catalog and ours go a completely other way. And that's a beautiful sure. thing about music. But I like, again, I feel like oversaturation is just one small part of it. I think sure. that folks are so tired and also um, oversaturation is, I, I, I feel like a, a bitch ass word when you don't have access to your fans the way that you once did. Well, and I think that search engine optimization and mm -hmm. I think that a lot of the algorithms and lack of access to your yes. own fans without paying like, I think it's kind of fucked up that once upon a time, and this is from a, you know, not even midsize at this point, we were just getting yep. started. We would have access to maybe, I don't know, a couple thousand people at one time would see our stuff. Mm -hmm. And this was like when we were first getting started. And then right before COVID, a couple hundred people, if we would go active. Now we're lucky if a couple dozen see it. But if we're asked to spend some money, Mm -hmm. Oh, you might get you might get interaction with a couple mm -hmm. thousand. You spend mm -hmm. this much, you might see this, you know, and right. it got to a point where, especially during COVID, where I felt like I was in a constant battle with mm -hmm. social media and mm -hmm. with this kind of stuff. But when we came back out on the road, I realized it was far more valuable. And I give this to any artist that's about to go out or waiting to go out. Sure. It is in your best interest to say fuck that to social media mm -hmm. and text your friends. Actually send an email to these people that you haven't seen in years. Mm -hmm. uh, let you know, send a message to them. Uh, they probably miss you just as much as you miss them, especially the artists that have toured for years and have whole ass lives in these other places, you know. Yeah. Um it's so much more powerful. To just get that little and i know it sounds a little extra but i think there's real power in that diy aspect mm. of going around any algorithm and going back to basic communication and yeah. reaching out and like full-on human connection where you know it wasn't necessarily an ad but i told every yeah. single one of my bandmates look if it's one promoter per venue mm -hmm. that maybe maybe has enough money for an assistant that might also be the bartender, that might also right. be the accountant, <laughs> that might also be the door guy. Who fucking knows? It doesn't matter yeah. however the club is functioning. We have to trust that they're gonna do what they can to the best of their ability. Mm. And we have to work as if something on their end is gonna fuck up that night, right? Mm. And so that means that the least that we can do is post mm -hmm. a flyer about our own show. The right. least that we can do is record a reel for every single city. Do sure. we want to? Absolutely not. But there are ways, there are ways that that stuff can be scheduled and post when it needs to without us ever getting online and interacting. Mm -hmm. And I understand why so many artists don't want to get on. And I understand why so many people that work on the branding and advertising and, and labels, whatever management side, say it absolutely needs to happen because it is right. a part of the job now. Sure. It is sure. a part of the job now and it sucks, but it is what it is. However, that doesn't mean that it gets in the complete way of creation. That means that, okay, maybe on Mondays and Thursdays, you do this and then the rest of your week is dedicated mm. to this stuff, right? Mm -hmm. um, and it doesn't have to take up any more of your week if you do all of your cities and all of your, your assignments in one day. And after doing that, we would see the, the increase happen, like the basic stuff from doing our social media the way that we're supposed to, right? Right. Um, and I'd say real basic as in like, we'd maybe see the needle jump for each one, maybe two ticket sales, maybe mm -hmm. five if we're mm -hmm. lucky. Taking the time to actually reach out to people, taking the time to send out an email blast on our things that we own, reaching out to people on Patreon, um, going back to our now damn near dead Facebook accounts right. to actually go and like be like, hey, I know you don't necessarily see my my music algorithm anymore, but let right. me bring this over here because as mm. a human being, it's actually somehow more powerful than this account that I have that has, I right. don't know, 10,000 times more followers on it. Right. But right. I feel like when it comes to true, just authentic art, when it comes to 
something interesting, something truly fun that mm. people know that they want to be at. It sounds ridiculous, but I feel like you can always get around an algorithm. I feel like you can always get around oversaturation. I feel mm. like you it's I feel like you can always get around all that shit because I've I've built a large yeah. chunk of my career doing that. Yeah. Uh, is it always the easy way to do things? Absolutely not. And it's really right. hard and yeah. it should not be like this, mm. but it's kind of low key what happens when the people that don't make music are in charge of a lot of it. Absolutely. There's so much there and so many gems. Um, and I want to, I've been, I've been taking <laughs> notes cause I want to touch on a lot of the things that you just mentioned, but, um, the big thing, like getting around the algorithm and making sure that you have this direct access to fans. And I appreciate that you, you know, brought up how you go to maybe some of the more non-traditional avenues or just any way that you possibly can get to your fans. And that's what, uh, you know, it takes to make sure that they're going to come out. Uh, you mentioned email and text messaging. I mean, that seems to be kind of one of the more tried and true methods as social media platforms come and go or rise and fall or the algorithms, you know, reward you and then squash and punish you. And like, you know, like you said, you, they'll they'll open the floodgates and then they'll restrict access unless you pay. Um, how have you maintained, you know, with the suffers, especially now for 10 years or so that you've been touring, um, how have you maintained that access and that relationship to your fans? Has it been through text and email? And if so, like, how have you been building that up? Is it just through all the social platforms and you just try to find ways to get to them? Is, has there been like a strategy around that? It's definitely been through everything. I think okay. it all started with the initial Patreon that we did to mm. uh, launch our first album. Yeah. And still having that email that original email list that got us started right and then cool. from there touring it went from like an initial couple hundred folks to a couple thousand and it's just mm. been growing over the years from that we always try to have excuse me we always should have something that people can easily join the list from the merge table or on the website or any yeah. of our social media links it always links back to it because at the end of the day <laughs> that's the only way that I, I feel like they're truly going to hear directly from us is like yeah. from the stuff that we control. And, you know, over the last, especially the last year in some of the podcasts that I've done mm -hmm. with other um, people in the industry, especially on the executive side and retired mm -hmm. executive side, sure. um, it's usually that same response where it's always been about the content that we own as mm. creators. And you know, leaning on companies like Meta and Instagram kind of make me feel the same way that I feel about leaning on Spotify and on sure. all these other places where it's like, I feel, <laughs> I feel many ways about it. And it would be different if we all got the same access as creators, but right. we truly, but we truly don't. And we right. never have. Mm -hmm. And, uh, it's it's a frustrating conversation that I've had with many artists because um, sometimes you sound like a real hater mm. when someone's having their moment and uh, for some reason you decide that inequity must be the conversation at that time, right? And sometimes it's hard to take a pause when you're in your moment of success to think about uh, the inclusivity and and just wait of what others have to deal with and how you could be using your platform to bring them in a bit higher, right? And mm. um, when I talked about the consequences of talking about just anything, mm -hmm. I mean, I've dealt with consequences from talking about things like basic uh, pay inequity at mm -hmm. the festivals. And I thought mm -hmm. that that was obvious shit, but mm -hmm. it wasn't, you know? And even now it's, <laughs> you hear about these people posting their TikTok salaries and all of that. And I'm like, bet you won't see that with no festival lineup. Let's talk about the kinds of acts that Performing Arts Centers, and also known as PACs, um, book. Most of the audience listening right now are touring musicians. Um, mm -hmm. So we we'll just, yeah, break down the kinds of acts that, that PACs book. Sure. So Performing Arts Centers, uh, 
a lot of uh, the work that goes through, a lot of the acts that do well are mm -hmm. things that people can relate to in some way. So a lot of tribute acts do really well, mm -hmm. but also um, so any anyone that someone's heard of in some way um, that has any sort of buzz going on or is related to something they already know. So a lot of acts that actually do really well are um, acts that have some unique twist on something. So for instance, my band does electro swing, which is mm -hmm. electronica meets swing music. Um, but I've seen other bands that do like metal mariachi, uh, huh. which is metalachi, I think is the name. I can't remember <laughs> the name. But anyways, they like kill it. The You might have seen on... Um, uh, like on YouTube, uh, the there's like a Piper band that mm -hmm. does like rock music, um, mm -hmm. and like a Scottish bagpipe band, um, or but also also groups that um, do original music and are just like really intriguing or uh, just have a great great uh, put on a great show. Also, artists that do you know singer songwriters that that um, really connect to their audience well, um, but basically. Acts that can um, be easily marketed are the ones that do the best. So, for instance, Celtic bands and Celtic dancers, those always do really well because that's something that's really easy to market for the performing arts centers to be like, listen, we've got this Celtic band coming in. Here's some videos. Hmm. People go, oh, I know what that is. And you know, pretty much right away, they might think, oh, I either like that or I don't. And pretty much everybody likes Celtic music to some degree. So that's a easier sell. So... Um, the artists that they want to bring in. <laughs> Is that true? <laughs> well, a lot, let's just say a lot of people do. Okay, okay. Um, so, no, that makes sense. I mean, it, it's kind of, um, it's less about selling the name of the artist necessarily and more about selling the event mm -hmm. to their subscribers because I guess uh, unlike a traditional music venue where the venue is selling tickets to a different show every night and 99% of the people that are showing up to the club know that band or there to see that band. This is more community focused. They're programming events uh, for the community. And so whether it's like the uh, Celtic rockers or Celtic mayhem or the Celtic superstars or <laughs> a night out with Celtic, Rayburns or whatever it's like <laughs> the, you know it's all the same essentially in the sense that they can market that like you said and kind of sell that to the audience so people are going to take chances because they know that the programming they basically stand by their local performing arts center it's programming and you're saying I don't know is there like a breakdown of like um, how many like subscriber numbers versus cold ticket sale numbers or just like mm -hmm. is it majority subscribers is a majority ticket sales per um, show or? I think it's it's different per per community but uh, okay. what I hear often is like maybe 40 or 50 or 60 percent in that range might be subscribers um, and then the rest are are individual sales um, but it really does depend on the community if there's some communities where the the majority of theirs are subscription sales and some mm -hmm. where it's um, we just performed for one recently where they didn't have any subscriber base Mm. which was really unusual, but, um, yeah. Um, well, one thing that's really cool about that though, is like you were talking about their programming, um, which is how it used to be for, for clubs, right. And other venues too, where right. people would go to the club cause they knew they would be able to see something great. Mm -hmm. Um, it allows them to have a program that, that varies. So maybe mm -hmm. you have the Celtic band. They're not going to have five Celtic bands in their program. They're right. going to have maybe one Celtic one band and then the next, the next act might be a singer songwriter that does original music or mm -hmm. it might be a dance uh, troupe that's presenting mm -hmm. or they, they need to have like a varied program. They want to have a varied program. So they stay interesting. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm like, I'm browsing my, I was like, I grew up in, in Madison, Wisconsin and, and I'm looking at the, uh, the, it's the overture center for the arts. Um, actually I'm going to do this. I've started doing this a little bit. If you're watching this right now, you, you can see, I'm going to share my screen quick here. Um, but I'm like on their programming page and everything kind of just saying is like, okay, so we see the pretty woman, the musical, but we also see, uh, an evening with George Winston. Okay. So he's, he's more well-known, but then here's the Prince tribute act here. Uh, an evening with Fran Lebowitz. Okay. Um, a little bit more famous, uh, Aaliyah, we have the hip hop nutcracker interesting so now we're getting into kind of christmas programming we have the straight no chaser group that's they've been around for a while um 
and the, we have Wynton Marsalis, okay, another name. But it's so varied. We have another musical, Hades Town. Um, Gabriel, I'm, I'm, yeah, go ahead. I'm going to kind of guess from this, uh, from this uh, rather a larger theater. Yeah. Um, there's the Red Hot Chili Pipers that I was talking about, actually. Um, and a lot of oh people. Oh my that, gosh, I didn't even catch that. I'm like, oh wow, they have the Red Hot Chili Peppers coming. It's like, no, the Red Hot <laughs> Chili Pipers. <laughs> oh yeah. Okay, there they go. Um, they do have a big theater. Uh, actually, they have multiple venues. So, like this one, for instance, uh, the Red Hot Chili Pipers bagpipes and with attitude. This is their description: bagpipes with attitude, drums with a Scottish accent, a blazing rock band, and show so hot it carries its own health warning. It's bagpipes. It's rock. It's Bangkok. ACDC meets the poet Robert Burns, where rock anthems sit comfortably alongside the great tunes from the glens and the mountains of Scotland. The Red Hot Chili Pipers, not the Peppers, a nine-piece ensemble. This is a great bio here. I mean, man, I, it's like it really, really sells it, and this photo is incredible of them, too. Um, that makes a lot of sense. But then we're looking at right next door is Black Violin, mm -hmm. which... Uh, do you know these guys? I've never yeah, heard of this. They're okay. super, super successful. Um, they've been, they kind of have been blowing up the last couple of years. Cool. Um, in the, in the performing arts market. Mm. Um, but one thing I was saying is like, this yep. is a bigger theater. It's got, um, kind of, uh, a lot of different variety, but, um, a lot of, of bigger artists, um, mm -hmm. and a lot of people that get started in the performing arts center market. Um, when you're not very as well known, mm -hmm. you might be performing at kind of smaller theaters, or mm -hmm. like you mentioned, the that that particular performing arts center had different stages. Yep. You might be on a smaller stage, um, right. and then as you get known through conferences and through uh, through word of mouth, because the presenters all talk to each other, um, you you might you. For our experience and the experience for the people we've worked with, they've moved on up to do bigger and bigger shows. You mentioned two buzzwords that which bring me to my next topics. Uh, presenters, what are presenters? Mm -hmm. Presenters are anyone that's presenting an act. Uh, so they're the people. That's how who how we describe the performing arts centers. We call them presenters. Uh -huh. um, so they're the people that are bringing bringing in an act to present to their community. Are uh, in other are they like talent buyers, promoters? I guess in the club market, uh, you know, we call them promoters. Is, mm -hmm. is that interchangeable? Is that kind of like they're the promoters for the performing arts centers? Yeah, they they're you can can you can think of them as as bookers as for the mm -hmm. performing talent arts buyers. centers. Got it. Yeah. Okay, bookers, talent buyers. Okay, so in the performing arts center, they call them presenters. Got it. Um, now. What are the ranges in terms of uh, like what are these people? What do you get paid to play at a performing arts center? Um, you know, like I don't know how many of these acts necessarily have massive followings, mm -hmm. but they have really great uh, marketing materials and a really great bio that sells it. It's like okay, I've never heard of the Red Hot Chili Pipers before, right. <laughs> but like I reading that bio, I was like, oh, this sounds like a fun night out, and no wonder they're charging sixty six tickets for it. Um, it seems like that could be something, uh, you know, that a lot of the community would just take a chance on because it's presented by a reputable organization in town, which is their um, performing arts center that they know and respect and love. And it's kind of an act that seems fun. So what do the bands make? What, is, what does Good Company yeah. make? What do other bands make that don't like have, you know, massive fan bases or Spotify numbers or whatever, but are, you know, doing these, these, this market? Yeah, so uh, it's a really good point you bring up that uh, our band, Good Company, is not very well known. Um, I would say that probably nobody watching this, unless we got some, some of my family watching it, probably yeah. knows who Good Company is. Uh -huh. And if we went out to you know Ohio to do a show, we would be drawing 10, 15, 20 people to a show. In a club, yeah. Um, and we would be getting paid negative money. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. Um, but that doesn't matter uh, when you're at a performing arts center and the the rate the rates they're they're used to paying for for entertainment. Um, mm -hmm. The rates vary pretty wildly depending on um, the venue and uh, and where you're coming from and what your act is. But the minimum I'd say that I've ever played for uh, from this market was for a festival that was local and that mm -hmm. was like a thousand dollars. Um, and the the most uh, that we get paid is like around the ten thousand uh, dollar mark for a show, um, and yeah. usually a little bit more if we're doing like outreach or there's some other things. And that's that's not counting um, 
the travel and the lodging and and uh, sale merch sales. That's that's just a base flat fee. That what's the so ten thousand dollars and how many people are in your band? Uh, we have six. Six people. So let's say what, what was what's the average amount? Would you say or the the typical amount you're making for uh, performing arts centers? I'd say it's um, well, I'm like a work. A holic. I, I don't. I try to have as much work as possible. I would say the average is around um, maybe five thousand. Oh wow. Um, okay. So I mean, that's not. I mean, that's incredible for a band without a fan base uh, <laughs> or much of a fan base. You know, like in in the Spotify numbers are you know negligible. YouTube numbers are. Ne it's like in this era where everyone is obsessed with the numbers. Uh, you know, like good company um, wouldn't be able to get. Five thousand dollars from a club in the states uh, to headline show anywhere, uh, but you're commanding five thousand uh, dollar performance fees regularly in this market, which is really incredible. And it's like something that you know is. And it, it, the, the thing is, is it's like it, it it flips the value proposition on its head because in the club market. The whole thing is we're going to pay you based on how many drinkers you can bring to a club because that's what we care about as a venue. All we care about as a venue is how many, how, what's our bar sales going to be? That's their business model. Mm -hmm. But the business model for performing art centers is not about selling alcohol. It's about providing uh, entertainment and programming for the community. Mm -hmm. And because of that, they're hiring entertainers and paying people to entertain. They're paying people for their work, novel concept. Um, and uh, and it's something where because you guys uh, put on a great entertaining show uh, and you've proven yourself now time and time again in the market um, and, and you're known now in the market, that's why you're able to command such fees um when your numbers necessarily like in this other realm in the in the mainstream music industry what we you know are so obsessed with and we talk about all the time uh you would never see and so there's this like really interesting niche market that you've found your your place in i would really recommend not just hopping in with both feet because you're going to spend a lot of money and not necessarily get any sort of return i okay. think that learning from someone that's done it before um and and has made the, the mistakes before you is really important so whether that's like joining us in our course um which i think is the best best uh best way to do it um <laughs> or if if you're like you know what like I, i'm not ready for that yet then reach out to people that are in that scene it can sure. you, if you, there's anyone in your local community that that's performing performing art centers or you might look up um you know, your local performing arts center, seeing who's playing there and maybe emailing them directly and being like, hey, I'm kind of interested in this world. Or cool. you can reach out to the conferences directly. Uh, there's Chances are there's a conference in uh, close to your area. There's several ones. There's ones across the nation. Mm -hmm. um, there's both stateside ones, state statewide ones, and national ones and mm -hmm. regional ones. Cool. So there's a lot of different uh, conferences. Um, you can reach out and find out more directly from them. But... Um, yeah. I actually had a friend that that uh, she um, immediately joined APAP, which is the nat nationwide one, and spent the money to be a member, and was planning on going to APAP. And she in had New York, which is in New York, and is the yeah. most expensive one, and it has all these different things that are very specific to APAP. Sure. Um, and if you don't know it, you're just you could be there just in a sea of of people, and and. It, have, be an expensive trip to New York, sure. and luckily, I was. She reached out to me. She was like, "Hey, I heard you're involved in this. Uh, can you tell me something about it?" And I was like, "Oh yeah, I wouldn't recommend doing this. I would recommend starting. You know, I gave her some pointers. Like maybe start here. You know, I'd be happy to take a look at your sizzle reel, which is how you apply for for conf for for showcases and how you market yourself. And so it's like this whole big world with like." hundred things to know and i think that if you you don't have that solid foundation you're just not going to succeed and you're going to mm. be a little bit frustrated for a good company we provide something that's really unique uh electro swing. there's not really um other electro swing bands um in the u.s there's one other now it's in eugene they've been around for a while now um but we're we're um 
one of the one of the only ones. So we would get a lot of people that would find us on on just Googling or uh. just just uh, you know we'd pop up when they'd search for Electro Swing Band U.S. Um, yeah. So they would reach out and they'd be like, "Oh, we love you. You, we love swing music, but we want something a little bit different." And um, do you guys do weddings? Blah blah blah. And so that's kind of how we fell into it, cool. and that's also how we fell into doing corporate work as well. Because event planners would reach out to us and be like, "We have a Great Gatsby event. We have a Roaring Twenties themed event. Um, are you available for that?" Mm -hmm. And so when we started off, we were like, "Oh." Yeah, I remember specifically asking the band at one rehearsal, like, we're gonna, I, I'm gonna book shows, but like, do you guys want to play weddings and other things? I'll be able to pay you, you know, X amount. And they were like, yes, we want that. We want to not work, you know, we want to make money for playing music. Right. So back then it was like, I'll pay you two hundred dollars each to play this wedding for mm -hmm. two or two hours. Everyone was like, awesome. <laughs> and um, and then over the years we've just like raised our rates. And raise our rates and we've gotten known to all the wedding planners and event planners in town um as like a, a good band to work with so most of our work now comes from referral mm. um and we that's that's the majority of i would say most people that everybody that plays in my band is full-time musician and um they play in different projects but i, I would say um good company is their number one income mm. and uh that's how we make like 99% of our money is from performing art centers and and uh, performing private events. Today's episode was edited by Maxton Hunter, theme music by Brassroots District, and produced by all the great people at Ari's Take.